The first years of the Great Crusade had proved to be a triumph for the Emperor of Mankind and those who shared his determination to reunite humanity. The Crusade's fleets and scouts, like its rogue traders militant, had re-established contact with the Night Worlds and the Mechanicum's Forge Worlds. Their potent military forces and manufacturing capabilities had been added to the Imperial Arsenal, making possible further expansion of the Crusade fleets. On the world of Pentacanes, a great tragedy had revealed the existence of psychic nulls. They too were recruited to provide the Imperium with a powerful new weapon against the rogue psychers whose existence had helped to bring on the terrors of old night. But it was a discovery made on an otherwise unimportant mining world only a few light years from Terra that ultimately reshaped not only the course of the Crusade, but of human history. The Emperor at last found one of his missing superhuman sons, a Primarch. This demigod of war had been created to lead the Crusade and bring his people back from the edge of extinction. Yet like all his kind, he had been shaped by the violent legacies of the Age of Strife, not by the guiding hand of the Emperor. This had laid seeds of darkness in his heart that would one day bloom into terrible consequences for his father and the people he hoped to save. To the galactic west of Terra lay a world so close to the Sol system that it had originally been colonized by sublight vessels during the first days of humanity's stellar exodus. The world, named Chthonia, had once been rich in minerals, producing adamantine, gemstones, and crystal dust in vast quantities. These had fed the industry and rapid settlement of humanity across the region during the Age of Technology and forged a stellar kingdom. But when the Principia Imperialis, the Emperor's own expeditionary fleet, reached the subsector where Chthonia lay, it was the only world determined to still be home to human life. They found the surface of the planet to be little more than a thin scar stretched over a vast network of tunnels that had been burrowed into the endless caverns that riddled Chthonia's crust. Though the world appeared lifeless, in fact the vessels of the Principia Imperialis detected human life in large numbers huddled in the subterranean remains of the ancient mines. When the Age of Strife came and the Great Warp Storms isolated Chthonia, the remaining miners on the resource-exhausted world were left to fend for themselves. Its mines long since played out, it was an orphan world, abandoned to violence and decay. As the mine entrances collapsed and the world's surface became unstable, the survivors fled underground into the great labyrinth of mining tunnels. But their new homes were similar to the hell of infernal legends. The air smelled constantly of sulfur and bled raw heat. Death came all too easily, from a magma breach into a tunnel, an earthquake that swallowed a subterranean settlement, or a pocket of poison gas that seeped into the warrens. The survivors lived their short lives in the heat and dirt of the mines, or the dust-choked confines of the old ore processing plants. Divided amongst themselves, they fought vicious little wars for the food and other resources that would ensure survival for just one more day. But mankind is resilient even in the worst of circumstances. As the centuries and then millennia slid by, the survivors of Chthonia did not dwindle away. Their population actually surged, transformed into hardened gangs of post-apocalyptic techno-barbarians. For these so-called kill gangs, there was no law but the law of the blade, and no desires beyond whatever it took to survive. The leaders of these gangs achieved their positions only through raw strength and cunning, creating territorial strongholds in the underground caverns. They exploited what remained of the world's technology and resources to feed their followers and maintain their positions. Others, not strong enough to hold territory, survived on plunder earned by raiding and murdering those who were. Life on Chthonia was defined by need. If it wasn't food, then ammunition or other equipment was always in short supply. And if one's belly was full and one's auto gun reloaded, then the fear of others was needed. For only being feared could provide the illusion of safety in this endless war of all against all. This life of constant violence created a culture where all things were transitory. Factions would form, evolve, and dissolve, sometimes in only a few months, their existence defined by an ever-fluid web of respect, tribute, and rivalry. Even for those who endured in power, there was only one certainty. Come what may, their time would pass. Once the Principia Imperialis detected such a large population of humanity on Chthonia, exploratory teams of the 5th Space Marine Legion, called Pioneer Companies, were dispatched to quietly scout the world. 
reports of almost unimaginable barbarism were returned, filled with disgust. The commander of one pioneer company called Chthonia a nest of serpents coiling in the dark that we would be better to destroy. But for the emperor and those dedicated to his purpose, this entirely missed the point. The Great Crusade was intended to rescue humanity from the consequences of the Age of Strife, not condemn them for what had happened. The Chthonians were not riven by mutation and possessed by warp entities such that they no longer deserved the title human. Instead, they had proven that mankind could adapt to unimaginable hardship and still survive. The Emperor traveled to the surface of Chthonia and offered its people inclusion within the Imperium as long as they accepted the terms of the Pax Imperialis. To his shock, he discovered that their greatest leader was actually one of his own sons, the Primarch Horus. Horus stood nearly twice the height of a normal man, completely bald, with the superhuman strength, intelligence, and charisma the Emperor had engineered into all twenty of his chosen demigods. But though Horus's gifts were easy to see, he had not been steeped in the Emperor's vision and educated like the Legio Custodes in the old ways by Malkador. He was shaped instead by the culture and mindset of Chthonia. His great charisma and intelligence had been intended to help others cast off the shackles of superstition and ignorance so they could embrace the light of reason and science. But he used them instead to forge strategic alliances with other gangs or motivate his followers to new heights of pillaging and conquest. His extraordinary strength had not been used to bolster his people's courage or bind them to each other, but to ensure his own dominance among them. Under the Emperor's care from birth, Horus would have learned how to use every one of his talents and abilities to better mankind and serve as an instrument of their salvation. Instead, Chthonia taught him to serve himself, for life's only purpose on that broken world was survival. Other people were merely tools to that end, and every day was about watching your back for the inevitable dagger someone sought to plunge into it. Yet Horus felt true kinship and affection for his father from the first, and in a desire to please him, willingly took up the burdens of the Pax Imperialis and the Great Crusade. But he would forever remain a child of two worlds, one of misery and despair, the other a golden dream of unity and progress born of a lost age he had never known. The Primarch could be taken from Chthonia, but the lessons of Chthonia remained forever inscribed on his heart. Horus was taken from Chthonia not long after his reunion with his father, and brought into the Great Crusade to serve the role for which he had been made. He was rapidly taught by his father to grasp the knowledge and traditions of the lost age the Imperium sought to restore. He traded the values of the Kill Gang for those of civilization. He was made familiar with the advanced technology the Imperium possessed, and was granted a seat on the War Council so he could join his father in leading the Principia Imperialis. But Horus's greatest reunion was with the 16th Legion of Astartes, the space marines who had been created from his own genetic line. Forged in his image, the bond between Primarch and Legion was unmistakable from the start. The 16th Legion was already heralded as among the Imperium's finest troops when a shock assault was needed, but under Horus's command their effectiveness increased by orders of magnitude. The Emperor believed that his Primarch could eventually lead his own fleet of the Great Crusade, effectively doubling its forces. However, his 16th Legion would need to be greatly enlarged. To that end, the Emperor decided to let Horus select the best among his own people on Chthonia to join the Legion and be transformed into Space Marines through the implantation of the Gene Seed. Just as the Emperor had helped Horus to assimilate into the Imperium and use his talents to better mankind, so would Horus aid the Chthonians. Their innate physical and mental toughness would be united with the discipline and purpose of the Astartes to transform them from predators into the protectors of humanity. The recruitment and assimilation of Chthonians into the 16th Legion proceeded rapidly. By the time Horus was ready to take full command of them, fully half of the Legion was Chthonia born. But at the same time, Chthonian values also began to alter the culture of the Legion. The changes were cosmetic at first, such as the adoption of the Topknots and Mohawks, often sported by the headhunters of the Chthonian gangs across the Legion, or deeply scratching a helm's eye socket after being wounded to honor a worthy foe defeated in battle. Others went further, such as the ritual recitation of the Chthonian word Abathon at the end of a campaign, once used upon the death of an enemy ganger in single combat. However, the 16th Legion's combat effectiveness only became even more lethal after the inclusion of the Chthonian recruits. 
The Emperor often referred to them as his wolves because he used them to break the most intractable enemies. Once the legionaries began to wear wolf pelts as symbols of station and adopted the wolf's head as a legion icon, the Emperor renamed them the Luna Wolves. This honored their first victory of the Great Crusade, the conquest of Terra's moon Luna. Over the course of the next three decades, the Emperor and Horus became inseparable as father and son, fighting together and saving each other's lives on many occasions. The Siege of Raelus was one such campaign early in the Crusade. The fortified human city of Raelus had opposed assimilation into the Imperium. The anti-imperial forces dug secret tunnels to infiltrate behind Imperial lines and attack the command encampment using hundreds of heavy shock troops. Unprepared for the assault and unarmored, the Emperor and Horus fought back to back until a plasma blast stunned Horus and sent him reeling to the ground. The Emperor stood over the wounded Primarch, refusing to give ground until reinforcements arrived and the Imperial forces earned another victory. Horus repaid the favor during the campaign against the orcs of the Scrap Empire of Goro. Goro was a world ruled by the technologically sophisticated greenskins known as mechs. They had developed a form of plasma technology that had proved effective in blunting the advance of the Great Crusade. At the Emperor's command, Goro had to be destroyed, and Horus and his Luna Wolves were the first to heed the call. The orcs of Goro were massive, many augmented with scavenged bionic enhancements. Their plasma weapons burned all too easily through Space Marine power armor. At the height of the battle, the fury of the orcs split the Emperor from his custodians. While he slew hundreds of them alone, an orc plasma blast weakened his defenses, and one of the orc mechs seized him. The creature's strength was so great that the Emperor's golden armor began to buckle. But as the beast prepared to throttle the master of mankind to death, Horus stormed through the press of battle and cut the orc's arms from its body in a single blow. Together, father and son would cleanse Goro until all that remained was a husk of scrap metal hanging in the void. After three decades of such heroics, the Emperor came to Horus and told him that he would take sole command of the Principia Imperialis for the first time. Horus was surprised, but his father explained with excitement that reports had been received of another world ruled by a leader with seemingly superhuman abilities. The Emperor believed that he might have found yet another one of Horus' brothers, another Primarch, but he intended to investigate the matter personally, leaving Horus in command of the Great Crusade in his absence. At first, Horus was elated at the prospect of being reunited with one of his brothers. He had fully embraced the cause of the Great Crusade, and knew that another Primarch at its head would allow them to bring thousands of more worlds into the Imperial fold. But the Chthonian within Horus also secretly dreaded the emergence of a possible rival to his place as the Emperor's most favored son. He could not forget the most important lesson of life on Chthonia. No matter how long you endured, or how bright your star, your time always passed to another. But Horus Lupercal was determined that no matter what, his star would never dim. <laughs>